First, I'd like to welcome everybody to class. Let's start by starting from here. Everybody say your name. Marley. My name is Tijuana. Tijuana. Come on, say your name since you walked in right on time. You good, you good. Thank you. Darla. Darla. All right. So, the way we like to start a class is first by honoring our ancestors. And the way we honor our ancestors is by libations. And again, today we have a special person who will be doing libations, and that is Sister Darla. <laughs> She'll lead and guide us from there. After, <coughs> well, morning. Yeah. I want it to be morning. I know. I've been saying morning all afternoon. <laughs> this is the beginning, so it's morning. I'll um, share. After I pour the libation, then say our stuff. To the continent that gives us life and hope. Ashe. Ancestors from that continent who came to this world and their guidance. Ashe. To Dr. Katie Cannon, who joined the ancestors this week, who spoke liberation for women of color. Ashe. To our children who are full of hope and joy and genius. I said. To those that facilitate our learning and our growth, especially by the phenomenon. I said. To Marcus Garvey, who didn't give up, mm -hmm. who saw the need to see ourselves. Who faced resistance but continued to move forward. I say. That we may learn well today. I say. I say. I say, oh. All right. So today, we are in August, and August is dedicated to Marcus Garvey. It's in the Pan African world, August is Marcus Garvey Month. And so all this month we will be focusing in and adding Marcus Garvey to our conversations. Because again, our conversation is about knowing ourselves. And the example I always like to use, and Sydney, I'll start with you. Sydney. Am I saying, is that Sydney? <laughs> Tiffany. Forgive me. Tiffany, if you wanted to make a tree well and the leaves are turning funny colors, what do you have to study first? The roots. You have to study the roots because the roots are the foundation of the tree. If the roots are good, then the trunk is good, then the branches are good, then the leaves are good. So that's also what we have to do. If we want to be the strong tree that we were created to be, that we were given divine seeds from, and understand we all come from divinity. We all come from the great creator. And so we have to study our roots in order that we can be the strong tree so that we can branch out and also we can be the beautiful leaves that people see. Make sense? Yeah. Ashe. So in studying our roots, we want to look at people who in our history have done things to allow us to be a better people because it's really about being a better person and, a, and better people. And children, if you want to... Um, after we finish with Marcus Garvey, if you want to color, that'd be fine. So today, we are blessed to have with us a young scholar. And she is uh, looking well, as always. And she's going to start us out with the reading as we talk a little bit about the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. Mm -hmm. Start. Marcus Garvey Biography. Civil Rights Activist, 1887 through 1940. Marcus Garvey was a proponent of the black nationalism and pan-Africanism movement, mm -hmm. and signed the Nation of Islam and Rastafarian oh. movement. So understand that it's out of Marcus Garvey that we have three great movements that came about. One, we had the religious revolution that took place with the 
founding of the African Orthodox Church. And this was founded by Marcus Garvey. And we talked about that a little bit last week. And the African Orthodox Church was founded on Marcus going back and studying history. And in studying history, we find out that first, Jesus was born on the continent of Africa. And when he had to escape for his life because of the bad folks over here in Rome who had come down here, he had to escape for his life with his father and his mother, and they escaped to Egypt. We know that Egypt is a black country, always has been, sits on the heartland of Africa and sits on the Nile River. So what Marcus Garvey started was the African Orthodox Church, and today we have the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church, which is an extension of Marcus Garvey. Also, we have the Nation of Islam, which has been a pillar of the African-American community, and we are honored to have Minister Louis Farrakhan leading the Nation of Islam and giving us insights that allow us to be a better people. And then we have the Rastafarian movement, which comes from specifically, we always think of it coming out of Jamaica, but it's also connected to Ethiopia. And the Rastafarian movement says, come back to nature. Come back to being yourself. Come back to being who you are and enjoy what the Creator has created for you. And we often associate Rastafarians with one specific thing. What's the first thing we say, we see, we notice with Rastafarians, Keita? Um, weed. Hmm? Weed. Okay, that's one thing. The, the, the taking in of herbs <laughs> to enhance one's feeling. What's another thing that we associate with Rastafarians? I think of uh, Jamaican dreadlocks. Um, Jamaican and Jamaican locks and and that that when I go other places around the world the first thing they always say is are you from Jamaica and I was like no I tell them I'm from Obama land <laughs> <laughs> and that brings a smile to everybody's face but those movements were founded by Marcus Garvey and there's another important movement that I want to speak a little bit about that was also guided and directed by Marcus Garvey it's the Harlem Renaissance because the Harlem Renaissance comes about in the 20s. And the Harlem Renaissance, does anybody else want to share any thoughts about what the Harlem Renaissance was? Well, primarily, I'll give you a little bit of history to it. The Harlem Renaissance basically took place up in New York. And what it was is, was black people were leaving the South, especially after World War I. Black people were leaving the South, and they said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of being down here on this plantation not going anywhere, not doing anything, I'm leaving. And they left and went north. And one of the places they went to was Harlem, New York. Now what had happened was in the 18, 19, 17, 16, 18, right around there it was World War I. And black people fought in the World War. And in the fighting in the World War, they were, they were awarded great honors in France. And then they came back to the United States, and they came back with a different attitude. They were not gonna accept the things that they had accepted before. And so they, a lot of them came to New York and they came to Harlem. And when Marcus Garvey came, he brought about the idea of black is beautiful, black is strong, black is great. And so he started the, I shouldn't say so, he re-energized the black arts movement, and it came about through the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance were poets, musicians, historians, all coming together to celebrate and speak to the black experience. And so the Harlem Renaissance was directly coming out of the impetus that Marcus Garvey brought. Why don't you keep on reading about Marcus Garvey. Who was Marcus Garvey? Born in Jamaica, Marcus Garvey was an orator for the black nationalism and pan-Africanism movement, to which end he founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. Garvey advanced a pan-African philosophy which inspired a global mass movement. Known as Garveyism, mm -hmm. Garveyism would eventually inspire others. From the Nation of Islam to Rastafari movement. Okay. Uh, Dollar, would you read the, the next paragraph? Early life. Social activist Marcus Mosiah 
Harvey Jr. was born August 17, 1887, in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. Self-educated, Garvey founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, dedicated to promoting African Americans and resettlement in Africa. In the United States, he launched several businesses to promote a separate black nation. After he was convicted of mail fraud and deported black back to Jamaica, he continued his work for black reparations to Africa. So the United Negro Improvement Association, as we talked about last week, was the largest organization of African people in the history of African Americans. Garvey over, organized over 5 million black people in the U UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association. And we talked last week about where some of his most prolific associations were. One, Jamaica. The folks in Jamaica where a couple of our students are going to next week were one of his strongholds. Second one was Cuba. And we talked last week about why Cuba connected with Marcus Garvey and how Cuba has been a bright spot for the Pan-African world over the last century. And the third hot spot, he did well in Harlem, but Louisiana, Marcus Garvey was loved in Louisiana. And, and that was where he had his most chapters in the United States. And so when you hear and see people gravitating toward the Essence Festival in New Orleans and they leave with a different kind of feeling, all of those things are connected to what Marcus Garvey brought about. Let's continue reading. Darla. Oh. Marcus Messiah Garvey was the last of 11 children born to Marcus Garvey Sr. and Sarah Jane Richards. His father was a stonemason and his mother a domestic worker and farmer. Garvey Sr. was a great influence on Marcus who once described him as severe, firm, determined, bold, and strong, refusing to yield even to superior forces if he believed he was right. His father was known to have a large library where young Garvey learned to read. So what do we see first about Marcus Garvey? What do we see first that we found out about him that you like to do? What did he like to do? Um, what was his favorite subject in school? Well, Marcus Garvey's favorite subject. Mm -hmm. um, what is your favorite thing that you like to do? Oh, I like reading. Reading. So we see how reading is a very important element toward development. And that's important for us too. Mm -hmm. Because reading is much better than television because reading requires you to use what? Your imagination and your brain. It makes your brain work. It's good to make your brain work. Reading also improves what you can see as possibilities. That's why people who read see things with more possibilities than people who don't. Because it, it strikes your imagination as you read. You may not have ever been to Jamaica but as you read about it, you start getting a feeling for it. And you start getting an understanding of it. And that's what reading can do. So one of the most important things we can do is read and teach our children to read at a very important and young age. Because in reading, that will spark their imagination. It's no coincidence that children who read and children who are using, asking questions tend to be the ones who wind up being the people who make the difference in the world. So let's go to the next page. Um, I want to say Sydney. Am I saying Sydney. Tiffany? I don't know why I keep wanting to say Sydney. Tiffany, would you read the next? Marcus became a, pr a painter apprentice. Mm -hmm. In 1903, he traveled to Kingston, Jamaica, and soon became involved in union activities. In 1907, he took part in, in an unsuccessful printer strike, and the experience kindled in him a passion for political activism. All right, so at 14, anybody remember 14? How old are you now? <laughs> 11, you'll get there. 14, I want you to think back about at 14. What are some of the things that you can remember about yourself at 14? We'll start here. Playing outside, hanging with friends. Playing outside, hanging with friends. A new beginning. Yeah. I could say, um, I remember cleaning my fingernails and pounding eggs. Uh-huh. <laughs> Spending a lot of time alone. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> so what do you remember about 14? Spending a lot of time alone in my room a lot. reading. And reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So 14 is an age when you are at the place where I like to say you're too old to ask and too young to know. At 14, you think you are indestructible. You figure that you got all this energy. And something about Marcus Garvey, too, he was a very physical person. In other words, he, he could run fast. He had a lot of muscles. He was very strong, very strong. He reminds me of my Uncle Gordon. I'll just share a story with you about my Uncle Gordon. My Uncle Gordon was in Virginia. And my Uncle Gordon, big brother, when we would come, he would pick us up and carry us from the road to the house because there was no streets. And when I was like Genesis age and Molly's age, he would just pick me and my sister up and just carry us on and he'd just be talking. But his physical strength was, was impressive. And, and this is the same thing for Marcus Garvey. But Marcus Garvey came to understand something, that his strongest muscle was not going to be his arms. His stronger muscles were going to be his voice and his ability to use his voice to bring about a change. And that's the lesson I want you to remember, Marley, that your strongest muscle is not your arms or your legs, but it's your voice. And so whenever you have anything that you are feeling or experiencing, use your voice to express it. One of the great things that is happening in the universe today is that our sisters, our women, have decided to use their voice. And as opposed to just going along to get along, using their voice to bring about a change. And this was one of the things that Marcus Garvey came to understand. And it was important because he understood it as he was in the printer's world. And this is going to, this is going to speak to something he figured out as he, as he went along, which was specifically I can speak to a lot of people, but if I put together a newspaper, I can spread the word even further. So he actually created his own newspaper to spread the message of Garveyism. Want to continue reading? Three years later, he traveled throughout Central America working as a newspaper editor and writing about the exportation of migrant workers in the plantation. He later traveled to London where he attended Barbic College, mm -hmm. University of Young, uh, excuse me, London, and worked for the African Times and Orient Review, mm -hmm. which advocated pan-African nationalism. Ashe. Okay, do you want to read the next one? Sure. Founding the United Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, Garvey's philosophy and beliefs. Marcus Garvey returned to Jamaica in 1912 and founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association with the goal of uniting all of African diaspora Mm -hmm. to establish a country in absolute government of their own. After corresponding with Booker T. Washington, the American educator who founded Tuskegee Institute, Garvey traveled to the United States in 1916 to raise funds for a similar venture in Jamaica. He settled in New York City and formed a UNIA chapter in Harlem to promote a separatist philosophy of social, political, and economic freedom for blacks. In 1918, Garvey began publishing the widely distributed newspaper, Negro World, to convey his message. So let's look at Booker T. Washington quickly. Because sometimes Booker T. Washington is not really understood, and it can be reinterpreted in history in a lot of different ways. I was fortunate I went to Hampton, which is where Booker T. Washington went to school. And so I learned about Booker T. Washington from people who knew him, not from people who had heard about him, but from people who knew him. And he said the first thing about Booker T. Washington was he was determined to make things happen. And he walked, I want to hear, well, listen to this now, Molly. He walked from down here in Carolina, he walked to Virginia to go to school. He walked. You hear that again? So that'd be like you deciding, you're here in Houston, and you decide that you want to go to school in El Paso. Oh, wow. <laughs> and you're going, to go to, you're going to go to UTEP in El Paso, which is over here. And you start out walking. And you walk. And you walk. And you walk through all kind of weathers. And remember now, he didn't have, uh, he didn't, hi Jazz. 
He didn't have uh, Jasmine and Dollar to stop at their house on the way. <laughs> he had to just walk, and everywhere he went, he had to communicate to find some place to stay and somewhere to be, and he didn't have much money. But he would tell people, I'm walking to Hampton because I'm going to be educated, and I'm going to go to Hampton. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he did. But it was that kind of determination that Booker T. Washington had. We can get into another class, we'll get into some of the things that Booker T. Washington was about, but the most important thing that we want to talk about today with Booker T. Washington is his determination. Mm -hmm. And that's important for us too, because if you're going to do anything in this world, you have to be determined. There's a nice word they use today, it starts with an F, what is the word? F-O-C, focus. Same thing. And my mentor who taught me about empowerment, said that there's a specific way to be determined, and that is you put out a goal, and then you measure everything by that goal. For example, if Jasmine is going to be a doctor, she measures everything by, is this conversation going to help me be a doctor or not help me be a doctor? Is me hanging out with Dollar going to help me be a doctor or not help me be a doctor? But everything is measured by whether it's connected to their goal, and that's determination and focus that's one of the things that Booker T. Washington had. That's also one of the things that Marcus Garvey had. And those are some of the personality traits that we want to keep in our mind. Figure out what it is that you want to do. Figure out what it is that you want to do. And then from there, measure everything by that and be determined. There are going to be bumps along the road. That's the old folks teach you, right? There's always going to be bumps along the road. But stay on the road, much like uh, our fate, one of our favorite movies. Anybody else seen The Wizard of Oz or The Wiz beside me? <laughs> and uh, one of the things about The Wizard of Oz, one of the morals of the story is stay on the road. You're going to run into all kinds of obstacles. You're going to run into all kinds of challenges, but stay on the road. And here's where your first challenge is going to be. Your church challenge is going to be with yourself. And your first challenge is going to be, am I really capable of doing this? Am I really able to do this, what I say? And I got a secret to tell you. You actually are. One of the blessings that the Creator has done in creating us as humans is He put inside you a gift. He put inside you a talent. He put inside you a genius. He put inside you an ability. And He gave you everything He gave you, she gave you, everything that you needed to make it happen. But you got to supply the energy, and the determination. That's your job. So if I say, Marley, we want you to read a book, you've got to decide, okay, Baba, I'm reading it. And if I run into a word I don't understand, what am I going to do, Jesus? Ask. Ask. And if, I, if nobody's around, what am I going to pick up, Gerald? And if I run into a word I don't understand, what am I going to do? Something new. Find somebody. Now, in the old days, what did we used to do, darling? We got a dictionary out. Now, now for our young folks, you just Google it, <laughs> which is a lot quicker than the dictionary, but that's part of using our technology to the good. All right, let's um, continue with Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. Black Star Line. By 1919, Marcus Garvey and you and I had launched the Black Star Line, a shipping company that operated from Hampton, South and Central America, Canada, and Africa. At the same time, Garvey started the Negroes Factory, Factories Association, a series of companies that were manufacturing marketable commodities in every big industrial center in the Western Hemisphere in Africa. All right, so now, these are the things that Marcus Garvey was about. And he did these things. He didn't just talk about them. He established the Negroes Factory Association. He established manufacturing places. Let me tell you two other things that Marcus Garvey did that were very important. Marcus Garvey realized that men need to establish who they are and stand up for who they are. So he took men and let them train in martial arts and gave them uniforms and made them part of the UNIA as the security force. And so he took the men and uh, tell me the first letter of your name, bro. Uh, C. C. Cam. Che. Che. All right, Che. So che, stand up. So he took a man like Che and he said, look, <clears throat> we want to make Che powerful. So we trained him. Come on out here. 
So we trained him in martial arts, and then we put a uniform on him. And we put this uniform on him, and we put stuff on him, we put a big hat on him. And then he had a parade in Harlem that came down the middle of Harlem, and these were the brothers who led before. Now, start marching over there, Jay. Now, you know, when you see a brother marching, what's the first feeling that you get? Honor. Honor. Praise. Praise. You can sit down. Keita, what's the first feeling you get when you see brothers marching in uniform down Harlem? Pride. Pride. Strong. <laughs> he wasn't scared. Determined. Determined. All right, so he did that for the black men. And this brought about that feeling of pride. And, 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 he, and they were looking sharp. He also did something for the sisters. What do you think is the most I say creative and at the same time most profitable work thing that sisters can do that they can take anywhere with them around the world. And my, my, my answers are all of these. Take a guess. Hair? Hair is close. Seamstress? Seamstress is close. Cooking. Cooking is another one. There's another, there's one other one I'm thinking about. Teaching is cool, but you can get into language things with teaching. Taking care of children? Ah, you're getting close. Nurturing. What was that? Nurturing. Nurturing is getting close. Who nurtured? What was that? Nursing. Nursing. There it is. I knew it was coming. Yeah, you put them together. <laughs> Nursing. One of the things that has always been true, my aunt, my grandmother, bless her heart, she had seven girls. And she took all seven of her girls and sent them to nursing school and said, at a black college and said to them, I'm going to get you this degree in nursing because if you become a nurse, you can go anywhere in the world and always have a job. And that was true when she did that back in the 1940s. And it was, it's always been true. There's never been a shortage of jobs for nurses. So what Marcus Garvey did, he had the nurses form an association, the Black Nurses Association, and they marched. And they were in their hats, and they were in their white, and they was looking, you know how sisters are. They had got their hair done, they had got their nails done, they was looking sharp. And so now here you are in Harlem, you're just coming out of the South, and you hear the, the, the band coming down the street. You hear the band and you're already getting excited. Then you look out and you see these black men marching in front. And then right behind them, you see these sisters coming down the block in their nurse's uniform. This changed the whole image of what black children and black people felt about themselves. And this was all done by Marcus Garvey. Let me tell you something else Marcus Garvey did. He decided to have a convention in New York. But he took his finances and he rented out Madison Square Garden. Now, Madison Square Garden has always been the biggest arena in New York. That's why they call it the capital of, of media and all that other stuff. That's where the New York Knicks play and blah, 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 blah. But he rented out Madison Square Garden and then brought all the brothers and sisters from Harlem and everywhere else to Madison Square Garden to celebrate the convention of the United Negro Improvement Association. Come on, sit up here, sis. So these are some of the things that Marcus Garvey did. Um, let's continue talking about Marcus Garvey, and let's go to Che. Right. Would you read the next? In August? Yeah. Mm -hmm. in August 1920, UNIA claimed four million members and held its first international convention at Madison Square Garden in New York City. For a crowd of 25,000 people from all over the world, Marcus Garvey spoke of having pride in an African history and culture. Many found his word inspiring, but not all. Some established black, some established black leaders found this separatist philosophy ill-conceived. W. E. Du Bois, a prominent black leader from off from the <laughs> prominent black leader and officer of the NAACP, called Garvey the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race in America. Garvey felt Du Bois was an agent of the white elite. Okay, so now first understand now you're in Ma now you're going back. You're in Madison Square Garden. There are twenty five thousand black folks from all around the world. When the convention starts, you know the first thing we do, we put on some, we play some music, right, to get everybody in. 
what Garvey does is he has the band play and he marches in the black men who are in his elite uh, uniforms. Then he marches in the sisters who are in their white uniforms. And then he starts the convention. So you can see the kind of excitement that's going on. One of the important things that, that I want to talk about with W.B. Du Bois is one of the phenomena about that we study here in our African history class is, is the fact of cause and effect and the fact that they are polarities, they are opposites. So I want to share this with you and, and, and remember this. Whenever you are doing good, evil is going to show up. Let me say that again. Whenever you are doing good, evil is going to show up. And if evil doesn't show up, you're not doing enough good. Because the energy that you're doing good with is going to attract evil that wants to stop you from doing it. What do we call that nowadays? I used to call it haters. What do y'all call it now? Throwing what? Shade. Throwing shade, being negative. So whenever you're doing something good, you're going to have somebody, you're going to have some evil show up and try to stop you from doing good. So what am I saying, Molly? If you're doing good in school, there are going to be a lot of people who say, oh, Molly, you're doing great. There's also going to be people who look at her. She ain't nothing. She just thinks she's something. If you're doing good, what's your favorite activity outside of school? Um, playing tennis. Playing tennis. Serena and Venus would be so happy to hear these words. <laughs> if you're doing good in tennis, there are going to be some people who say, oh, she's doing great. There's also going to be about people who talk about, she ain't never going to be no good. She's just wasting her time. That's a phenomenon that's going to take place all the time, and it can never stop you now that you understand what it is. Understand again, you may not like this reality. It's like, it's like gravity. You may not like it, but it is part of the universal law. Whenever you are doing good, evil is going to show up. Now, here's the other part of that. Evil is not going to show up to destroy you. Evil is going to show up to bring you closer to the people you are doing good with. Got that? So Marley, when they tell you in school and, you, and you're on the honor roll and they come in, oh, she ain't nothing, you come back and you say, Mama, when I was at school today, this little girl came over and told me that I wasn't going to be nothing. And Mama says, Mama, so what do you say? She's throwing shade. No. <laughs> She's throwing shade. I say. Then Molly comes into class on Saturday and says, Baba, when I was at school, somebody told me that, you know, my reading and I, I'm not going to be successful. And then everybody in the class says, Molly, they give, they give you an understanding. This is always going to happen. Don't let it stop you. You know, if you need any help, if you need any assistance, we're here to help you because we are going to help make you succeed. So evil shows up to force you to communicate with the people that you are doing good with about what you are dealing with. And then you become closer. So as I said with Jasmine, I said, Jasmine, you know, I have a class on Saturday. And somebody came in and said, you know, that Negro ain't doing nothing but just bringing people over there. He don't know nothing about history. And I'd be like, ain't that cold blooded? And then, and then Jasmine says, what does Jasmine say? And so I keep on spreading the word. But that's true of everything. And that's going to be true in, in your personal experience. And that's one thing we can learn from history and from Marcus Garvey. Whenever you're doing good, evil is going to show up. But evil is not going to destroy you. Evil is going to bring you closer and have you have a more intimate relationship with the people that you are doing good with. Because you're going to share your feelings with them. And that gets back to what we talked about earlier. Your most important muscle is your voice and sharing what you are experiencing and feel with people who are positive and who are about you. Three things we talk about all the time. One, you don't never have to make evil feel happy. I got that? You never have to make evil feel happy. Two, selfish individuals, people, they will never be satisfied. So don't try to make them happy either. <laughs> don't eat, you ain't got to make evil happy. You ain't got to make selfish and individual people happy. And the third thing is misery loves company. All miserable people are trying to do is get your energy to help them be, stay miserable. 
So, Misery Loves Company, stay away from them. Have a force of people who are positive around you. Evil will never be satisfied. You ain't got to make evil feel good. And the, the reality is that um, things will happen, but stick together and everything will work itself out. The second thing I want to say about this is W.E.B. Du Bois was an opponent of Marcus Garvey in the beginning. But later on, W. E. Du Bois said, if there's one thing that I would have changed in life, I would have supported Marcus Garvey rather than fighting against him. He said it's the one regret he had in his whole life that he didn't understand and fully completely connect with what, what Marcus Garvey was doing. He said, if I could do anything over again, I would have joined with Marcus Garvey as opposed to opposing him. And that's significant because one of the things that's going to happen with us, and this is another lesson of history, you may start out in one particular place with a particular mindset. And there may be people who will share with you things that you should do. Like, like mom will say, you know, you should go here, but you don't do it. One of the most important things to do is come back and recognize your own mistakes. And then be willing to say, you know, you know, Che, when you told me to do it this way, I didn't, but I, I should have, and you know, I'm gonna get better. And don't beat yourself up about it, because the way you get better is learn from your mistakes. You know, I'm a basketball coach, and I teach, and when I'm teaching my kids basketball, I tell them, it's not the shots that you make that's gonna make you into a good basketball player. It's the shots you miss, because the shots you miss will tell you what you need to do in order to make it the next time. One of the great things about life is it's not falling down that's going to bring you down. Falling down is going to help strengthen your legs because you're going to get up. It's getting up that makes you who you are. One of the things I share with children all the time is there are four steps to everything in life. First, you have to crawl before you walk. You have to walk before you run. You have to run before you fly. And that process is true of everything. You're going to start out crawling, and I'm not going to make you crawl today. But what happens when you crawl? Uh, let's go to somebody who used to crawl a lot. Gerald, what's the first thing that happens when you crawl? Your hands and your knees get dirty. Your hands and knees get dirty, and they get a little rubbed up. <laughs> what's the first thing that happens when you try to run? Tell me your first name, sir. I'm Rosalind. Rosalind. Rosalind the runner. What's the first thing that happens when you try to run, Rosalind? Uh-huh. And then what happens? One foot in front of the other. And then you get, as you run, you get winded. Yep. And then what happens next? You get tired. You get tired. And, and you have to stop. So what happens after you walk? Now you learn to crawl. Now you learn to run. You finally get winded. Now you, now you're running. When do you start to fly? Darling, when do you start to fly? You start to fly when you accept yourself and um, yeah. when you accept yourself and use your gifts. When you accept yourself and use your gifts and realize you have limits. You can run a long way, but you can't run forever. But you can learn to fly. And that process is the same process that our African ancestors taught us is that Everything follows that process. If you want to be good at something, you have to start out with it, and you're not going to be good at it. Then you have to keep working on it with that determination and will. Then you're going to get a little better at it. You're going to start walking with it. Then you're going to start running with it. Then you're going to actually learn how to fly, where you can actually take off and make things happen. So let's continue on about where I said, whenever you're doing good, evil's going to show up. If you're black in America and you're doing good, what, what, what's the first form of evil that's going to show up? There's two forms. What's the first outside form that's going to show up? Uh, Jasmine. Um, the first outside form? Okay. Mm -hmm. The haters. The haters. And the haters in America, if you're black, what do they tend to look like first? A lot of the Right. Like the paper, right? All right, so the first thing that's going to happen when you're doing something good, especially in America and you're black, the white supremacists, the white haters are going to come out. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, Gerald, talk about Under Surveillance by J. Edgar Hoover. 
Yeah, read that. Oh, you. Yeah. There you go. It starts with but W. B. Du Bois. Yeah, but W. B. Du Bois wasn't the worst adversary of Marcus Garvey. Uh, Garvey. History would uh, soon reveal FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover fixated on ruining Garvey for his radical ideals. Hoover felt threatened by the black leader, fearing he was inciting blacks across the uh, country to stand up in militant defiance. Mm, keep reading. Hoover referred to Garvey as a notorious Negro agitator and for several years desperately sought ways to find uh, de demanding personal information on him, even going as so far as to hire the first black FBI agent in 1919 in order to infiltrate Garvey's ranks and spy on him. They placed spies in the UNIA and historian uh, Winston James. They sabotaged the Black Star Line. The engines of the ships were usually damaged. Were actually damaged. Uh, were actually damaged, yeah, by uh, foreign matters being thrown into the fuel. Mm -hmm. However, Hoover. Hoover, Hoover would use the same method uh, decades later to obtain information on black leaders like uh, Martin Luther King and um, Malcolm X. All right. So we see how evil is going to show up from the outside, right? I'm not even going to spend much time on that because we already know about how that works. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead on to the next paragraph. Jasmine. Charge reported to Danica. In 1922, Marcus Garvey and three other UNIA officials were charged with mail fraud involving the Black Star Line. The trial records indicate several improp improprieties occurred in the prosecution of the case. It didn't help that the shipping line's books contained many accounting irregularities. On June 23, 1923, Garvey was convicted and sentenced to prison for five years. Claiming to be a victim of politically motivated miscarriage of justice, Garvey appealed his conviction but was denied. In 1927, he was released from prison and deported to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Garvey continued his political activism and work of the UNIA in Jamaica and then moved to London in 1935. But he did not command the same influence he had earlier. Perhaps in desperation or maybe in delusion, Garvey collaborated with outspoken segregationist and white supremacist senator Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi to promote a reparation scheme. The Greater Liberia Act of 1939 would deport 12 million African Americans to Liberia at federal expense to relieve unemployment. The act failed in Congress, and Garvey lost even more support among the black, black population. Okay, so understand that they plotted, and this is something that we must learn from Nat Turner, from Denmark Bessie, and from Marcus Garvey. Your main enemies are never going to come from the outside. They always will come from the inside. That's an important understanding because you cannot infiltrate the UNIA with people who look like Donald Trump. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you have to find somebody who is willing to take on the work of the white master in order to infiltrate what's going on. And J. Edgar Hoover, who hated black people, known racist, there were no black people in the FBI. So what he did, even despite his hatred, he hired the first black FBI agent specifically to infiltrate Marcus Garvey's movement. And one of the things he did also that, he gave money. He gave money to entice others to go along with what he was about. Now, one of the things that we are learning in African American history in this class is there are two separate cultures that are always at work. There's the African culture, and we've talked about some of the proponents of that with Mayat and, and the Nguza Zaba, the principles, and we've talked about the car. We've talked about all those things. But there's also Western culture, which is absolutely opposed to African culture. And Western culture has a seduction. 
It seduces people. And it has two, three primary forms of seduction. And here's what they are. The first seduction is material. So it will give you the idea that if you get all this material stuff, you will have a better life. But the price that you pay for the material stuff is you have to sell your soul. That's why most of us at some point who are working feel like, you know what? I got to get away from these people here and do my own thing because they are, I'm just, my soul is being lost. So the first temptation is materialism. And it comes in all forms, cars, you know, houses, hours. And the one thing the old folks will tell you is money cannot buy you what? Happiness. happiness. Huh? Money cannot buy you happiness. And money cannot buy you love. That's the first temptation. That's the first seduction. The second seduction is to appeal to your physical nature, which is your lowest nature. So it appeals through sex and, and, and appetites to, to get you to participate in what it's about. So that's what it, it's going to appeal to the lower nature. It's not going to appeal to your higher nature. It's going to appeal to the lower nature. So you have to be aware that materialism and this appealing to your lower nature are two of the things that this culture is going to try to seduce you. And the third thing, which is the one that is kind of obvious to us, really, is it's going to try to separate you from your God, from nature, and from your community. The three foundations of African culture, a correct relationship with the creator, correct relationship with nature, a correct relationship with community. Western culture is going to separate you from all of those. It's going to take religion and get you to try to go in its direction, which is no direction at all. It's going to take nature and try to make you an enemy of nature or tell you that you're fighting nature, which you're not. And most importantly, it's going to bring about divide and conquer with you, with other people. So those are the three elements that we have to always be aware of. And those are the three elements that we can learn from history that were used, not just with Marcus Garvey, but they did the same thing with Martin Luther King. They did the same thing with Malcolm X. It was the reason why Denmark, Denmark Vesey's um, revolution in North Carolina was portrayed by another black person who felt that it wasn't going to work, so he told the white man it was happening. Nat Turner, who was on the run, got the same thing. So, one of the things that, can, that you can do to, to deal with that is trust your spirit. One of the things that you have in a way to understand that, one of the weapons that you have to, to, to understand where your enemies are coming from is trust your spirit. If it don't feel right, it ain't right. All right. Let me say that again. If it don't feel right, it ain't right. And it doesn't matter what the trappings are on the outside look like. It doesn't matter what the words look like. Because words can fool you. Trust your spirit. Trust your spirit. Because your spirit will always lead you. Now, if you're around other spiritual people, like uh, I get a chance to be around a lot of spiritual people, they can pick up on things before people even open their mouth. Because they they're picking up on energy. And they can pick up on negative and positive energy. So that's why I always say it's always good to have, if you're a brother, it's always good to have a sister working with you because sisters have a, a definite intuitive way to pick up on energy. And they will, they will tune out words and just pick up on energy. If you're a sister, it's good to have a brother there because he can pick up on energy too. He can be like, you know what? That brother don't feel right. <laughs> and you'd be like, but he tall, he handsome, he got a nice car, he got a good job, he got money. And brother's like, you know what? I'm just trying, you know, I'm just trying, to, something ain't right with the home. But you have to trust that spirit. And it's, the successful revolutions that we've had were all about spirit. So when you look at the brother we talked about a couple of weeks back, Toussaint L'Overture, who they said was connected with voodoo. Well, voodoo is all about the feeling and all about the spirit. And he had spiritual guides who would let him know, hey, this feels right, this don't feel right. Getting a little closer to home. The, um, we talked about Cuba, right? One of the things about Cuba is staying close to their religion, which is the Santeria, which is the understanding the Orishas, staying close to the Ifa faith, which is again about the feeling. Actually, Martin Luther King was very successful because he understood how to commit to the feeling and knew that the spirit was what was going to give him the power to do what he could do.
You can't ask people to walk across the Pettus Bridge with sticks and stones and mad dogs unless they are feeling spiritually lifted. And, you know, but once you get the spirit, it's like, hey, it's all, I'm good. So one of the lessons that we learn is whenever you're doing anything, begin with a spiritual connection. Make that spiritual connection. Now, the, uh, the old folks in the community used to say, if you have a problem, they used to say this to me all the time, if you have a problem, brother, there's three things you need to do. First thing, you need to pray about it. Then after you pray about it, you need to find other about, you need to talk to other people about it who can help you with it. And then after you talk to other people who can talk and you prayed about it, then you can actually go do it. But that's the process. First, you pray about it. You make a connection to the spiritual realm. And that can include ancestors, creators, have, have a mechanism you want to pray. You pray about it. Then you get connected to other people who are of the like mind that you are, and then you go out and do it. And that's, that was the mechanism that they gave me then. Go ahead. This is, um, I want to go back to what we were talking about with mm -hmm. uh, him to, um, gathering these people to go back, Americans to go back to America. Okay, that was an idea. They put that forth as, as just a, a plan. It was never done. Right, but wasn't it also one of, well, I was going to mention that one of the biggest rifts between him and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, that concept as well. Yeah, because W.E.B. Du Bois said, you cannot, W.E.B. Du Bois by 1939, by 1935, had come to a whole other understanding of things. And one of the first things he said, when he wrote his book, uh, The Souls of Black Folks, the first thing he said is the greatest conflict that's going to take place in the 20th century is the, is the conflict between the races. And by 1935, 1937, the boys had come to understand that, look, if there's one group of people that you cannot trust, who have shown over many, many years they cannot be trusted, it is these folks, led by Senator Theodore Bilbo of the United States Congress. The history of, of America is bent, is written on white folks saying one thing and doing something else, all right? My brothers and sisters from the Native American community will tell you they speak with forked tongues. Understand this in the history of America, when this little joint was put together. First of all, there were people here, lots of them, and they wiped out at least 50 million people to create this place called the United States of America, at least 50 million. Secondly, they put together treaties with the Native Americans. They put together over 165 treaties, and they broke every single treaty they ever created. Not one, not a couple, every single treaty that they put into place with the Native Americans, they broke the treaty. Go ahead, Roz. You know how you can say, mm -hmm. well, it goes back to something else you said about the, see, there's a, a Western, you know, and a, there's just a different worldview. Absolutely. It, they don't jive. They don't jive. Because with, like with Native Americans, um, when people come, you know, it's, it's, they have a different concept, like of, like owning land and oh like, yeah, and Africans as well. It's mm -hmm. like, but the Western is like, this is mine or right. this, I own the, you know, and it's just a different. It's a totally I don't different. See how it ever would? I don't think it would ever work. I mean, it just won't work. Right. Well. We, we can talk about that some more in terms of understanding the dynamics between these two, two distinct cultures and where they come from and why, and why they are so diametrically opposed. And one of the things that is definitely connected to that is like this whole thing about owning stuff. In the history of African people and people of, of indigenous cultures around the world, they didn't have fences. They didn't believe in fences. They didn't have territory. They didn't take something and draw an imaginary line and say, I own this. And if you come into this, I can do to you anything I want to do. That's insane when you think about it. Because first of all, they didn't create the earth. <laughs> so how are you going to own something you didn't create? That's like 
you know, I get, I, I use this example all the time. Making me pay for water is criminal and diabolical because they didn't create the water, but they're gonna make me pay a dollar for the water or more. The idea that there existed in the world a time when there were no borders, when there were no prisons, when there were no police, when there were no boundaries. And this was the way the world was. It wasn't until the Western culture comes that they put up a fence and say, you know, if you step across this line, I can throw you in my prison and do all kinds of things to you. So it's, all of this was created by Western culture. And it, it was, it's only a recent phenomenon too. Because when you look at history, if you look at the last 500 years, which is when Western culture has been dominant, that's a very short period of time. But it's still, but it's the time we in. So we got to deal with it, you know. And you want to share something no, I else? I want to ask you a question. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, with all this controversy with immigration and all that, mm -hmm. I just went back and I was looking at some Old Testament scriptures about sojourners, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that struck me is that every, all these different scriptures talked about being kind to sojourners. I mean, it wasn't a, there wasn't a, right. you, know, you treat them like you treat anybody else that's in your tribe or in your community or whatever. How, how right, they did. and that was the way of the world. The way of the world was, one, you leave out Africa and you, and you go on a, a trip. And when you go on the trip, you take your culture, you take your drums, you take your woman. <laughs> you don't go, you know, that whole idea of all men going on a ship together is insane. But, you know, when African people and other people traveled, they went with males and females, which makes sense. Okay. And then they would go places and they would visit. Visit means you go, you stay a little while, and then you go home. The only people in the world who ever decided they didn't want to go home were the folks who came out of here. They're the only people in the history of the world who decided they didn't want to go home. Everybody else would go visiting, go trading, and trading was sharing things, passing on information, passing on knowledge, passing on rituals. Everybody else was like, okay, cool, and we love being here, but we're going home. But then came these folks who didn't want to go home. And we could talk about that all day, but I'm, I'm going to leave it right there. I want to continue. I want to finish up with, with Marcus Garvey. And then let's go to the, the last paragraph and Tijuana. God bless you. his remains were exhumed and taken to Jamaica, mm -hmm. where the government proclaimed him Jamaica's first national hero and re-entered him at a shrine in National Heroes Park. But his memory and influence remain. His message of pride and dignity inspired many in the early days of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 1960s. In tribute, to his contributions, Garvey's bust has displayed in the Organization of American States Hall of Heroes in Washington, D.C. The country of Ghana has named its shipping line the Black Star Line and its national soccer team the Black Star in honor of Garvey. Ashe, we can talk, there's a lot more that, that Garvey did that we mentioned in some of our conversation already, but I also want you to know because we have two of our students who are going to Jamaica, three, excuse me. We have three of our students who are going to Jamaica and you know one of the places you're gonna to have to go, right? What was the name of that place? Heroes Park. Heroes Park, right. You're gonna to have to go to Heroes Park and we're gonna we we see pictures of y'all standing there with all the heroes and bring them back to, to us at class. The um, other thing about Marcus Garvey that, that, that really is really in, in significant and important is that we learn from our history and we learn from those who have come before us. And the, the, the joy of talking about uh, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey is the fact of what he did. If you can imagine what life was like a hundred years ago, 
We're, this is 2018, right? We can imagine what life was like in 1918. If I had said to you in 1918, a black man is going to come along and organize five million black people. He's going to start his own shipping line. He's going to have his own factories. He's going to have a nurses association and a military association of black men and black women. He was going to form an African Orthodox Christian church where Jesus and Joseph and Mary were once reinstated as black. He was going to have a convention at Madison Square Garden. It's going to have 25,000 people. You would have said to me, you know, brother, whatever it is that you're drinking or whatever it is that you've been taking into your body, you need to stop because you're obviously out of your mind. But it happened. If I had said to my, if I had said to my father, who's going to turn 99 in September, if I had told him in 1960 that Pop, you know, uh, we're going to have a black president, and him and his black wife are going to occupy the White House, and he's going to have two daughters, and they're going to, they're going to be in there for eight years, and we're going to have. Um, black men running Eastern Kodak, and we're going to have black people who are going to be head of the CEOs of all the kind of major industries. And when you go back home to Virginia, uh, that you're going to have white people serving you, and, and they're going to be real nice to you. My father would look to me like, my son, whatever you are drinking, and whatever you are taking inside of you, you need to stop. And then if I had told them in 1970, hey, Pop, by the way, um, we're going to have movies that have all black cast, they're going to be directed by black people, and they're going to talk about the greatness of Africa, how it began. It's going to talk about how great African people can be without any white folks in their life, and how they're going to once again rule the world, and it's going to be a movie, and we're going to have people. It's going to be the number three selling movie around the world. We're going to have over, over 100 million people watch it across the world. He just said, my son, Whatever it is that you're drinking, <laughs> and whatever you are taking in, you need to quit. Because the phenomenon of Black Panther would have been beyond his imagination. But that's where we're at. And it's all connected to all these things have its roots, because we like to study the roots, in what Marcus Garvey did. Without Marcus Garvey, none of these other things take place. So we could talk all day about what didn't happen, but let's remember what did happen, because that's the lesson that we want to take. And that's what we're going to get. How long are you going to be in Jamaica? Uh, a week. A week. So you won't be here next Saturday. No. Because you'll be in Jamaica. Be there. And you'll be vibrating us. But when you come back, we can look forward to in two weeks, our students coming back with all kind of great stuff. And here's the other great thing about Marcus Messiah Garvey. And one of the great things about Jamaica is last, I think it was last year or the year before last, Jamaica made the studying of Marcus Garvey's book, the philosophy opinion of Marcus Garvey's book, mandatory for all students in Jamaica. And so all of our children who are going to school in Jamaica are learning the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Messiah Garvey. And so some of our children today who didn't know about Marcus Garvey but they got here, say amen, amen. know about Marcus Garvey now. And, and, and Marley and, and the rest of the gang know when they hear the word Marcus Garvey, they say, oh, I know about him. I heard about him in class. Ain't that right, Marley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, next week, uh, we didn't get to it this week because we're running out of time, but we have our seven personality traits that Keita wants me to make sure I get to. So next, next week, we're going to continue with these seven personality traits that we're talking about. And as we talk about them, you can read over them during the week because we're going to go through each one of them and show you how you have aspects of all these seven personalities and how you have to be like aware of how to use them and recognize that your, your worth is never dependent upon who, evil or shades or any of the other folks saying you cool. It's all about the good positive people saying that's cool. And that's what we did. One of the things that we have learned from being here in this country with African Americans is how to put on the mask. And we wear the mask whenever we need to wear the mask. And the mask is, we put on the mask to look one way, even though we are feeling some other kind of way. And for our, our young people, if you ever get a chance to read a book called The Spook Who Sat By The Door, 
It's a good story about how the mask works. So um, I'm not going to have you read it this week and come back with it when you come back. But just put that in our notes. The Spook Who Sat By The Door is a good one to read. So we're going to uh, wrap up for the day. But as always, we want anybody to share anything, any spirits, feelings, thoughts that you had at class today. Also, on the way out, we have our love basket behind our map of Africa that you can make a donation. I know Gerald has to go because he's always got that, like, why would you keep me too long? You good today? Okay, so we're going to start with uh, Gerald. Share any thoughts, feelings from, from your experience in class today. Uh, one other thing, other than that, I've already mentioned was that, um, and I didn't know about Martha's God, but not surprised still, though, is that uh, his mentioning of, your, of material things mm -hmm. as being a way which I see was still manipulated. And a lot, it, it's a huge um, negative. Not only in the U.S., but you know, I can see that mm -hmm. in Africa as well. How many people are, you know, they're saying how many people are living real poor because white and now the Chinese are coming in, paying politicians under the table, and they're, you know, and they living well, and and the people are living like paupers. Mm -hmm. So many of them are. You know. And let me say this. Let me say this too. To add on what Joe was saying. Because people look like they're living well, don't think they're living well. Because I had the fortunate pleasure of growing up in New York and being going to school with people who, thought, who supposedly were living well. And I'm telling you, they're not living well. Understand that, like we talked about with the chakras, your energy has to be right. And my sister Lauren Hill said it best. How are you going to win if you ain't right within? If you're not about the good, you may look like you're doing well, but you're not doing well. Because you got to go to sleep at night, you got to face the man in the mirror. So it's all about being on, using the principles that we, we've talked about many times, about being good. You, the universe is a reap what you sow universe. If you're not doing good, you're not going to have good things happen to you. And it doesn't matter what the looks like on the outside, that's what's really happening. You want to share your thoughts, feelings, experience here in class today? Use that voice, that big voice. Um, I don't think I have one. Yeah, you do. How you feel right now? Mm -hmm. I read that I got to learn about him more. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Let's swing over to this side. Dollar? Um, I enjoyed learning more about Martha Garvey and um, the thought that the haters are always going to be there. Mm -hmm. but that they provide a purpose as it draws you closer to the people that you need to be. Okay. Uh, two things. The first was Marcus Garvey because I was thinking about him a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that I wanted to know more and <laughs> here I am. Okay. So thank you. And then also what you mentioned about the spirit and about working and feeling that spirit being taken away from you because that was an experience that I'm just moving away from, mm -hmm. which is why I have the blessing of being able to be here. Ashe. So um, it was very confirming for me. Thank you, Papa. Jasmine? Tiffany. Tiffany. I got it all cut. I was going to create all kind of names for you. Go ahead, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, I mean, I just feel like it's a blessing to be here and just like how easily black people are able to be manipulated and talking to infiltrating their own people. It's almost like, I can't, you're not saying that maybe that would never happen with Jews, but why is it always, we are so easily manipulated by materialistic things. Let me just give you this to mess over her or him. Or, it's like, is there no loyalty? Well, actually there is, but the revolution ain't gonna be televised because we're here because of loyalty because of people who actually did things. But we also have to learn from the things that we see on the, going on. And let me say this. <clears throat> We've been here since the beginning of time, and despite this loyalty, crack, heroin, Planned Parenthood, we're going to be here. And we're going to be here, and we're going to keep on moving. And uh, Wakanda forever. <laughs> Ross? Um, yeah, I appreciate 
the topic of uh, Marcus Garvey. I had a chance to, you know, he's, he's always been a figure that has been, you know, here. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a chance to, we were doing a program for kids and I wanted the kids to learn speeches. Mm -hmm. So I went into his speeches, his collection of speeches. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was blown away by um, some of his speeches. So mm -hmm. I gave some kid this little excerpt of his speech. And, mm -hmm. um, he did a really good job with it. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm, you know, I would love to do that again and again. So you could like internalize that. Yeah. Just internalize his words because they were so profound. And the thing that strikes me is that he is just as important today. He's more important today than he was even during his time. So he might have been slightly ahead of his time, but he is so important today. The other thing that I learned mm -hmm. today is that I did not know that J. Edgar Hoover, that's the same J. Edgar Hoover? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm was active even back, I mean, how old was this dude when he died? It's, what, in the 70s, in 73 or 4? How like old Sean was Thurman. he? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cockless. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. he was that active for that long. There you go. Kita? Uh, I was inspired by Marcus Garvey's determination, mm -hmm. and even here in Booker T. Washington's determination. Um, I think that that's lost, like a lot of people aren't as determined, as focused as, as we could be. Mm -hmm. So just, and just to start out self-educated and to make that much of a difference in the world is, is amazing. I, I can't even wrap my head around that. And uh, just what you were sharing towards the end about pretty much karma, um, just a, a personal thing that's going on with me, I just talked with my therapist about it and then to hear you say it, it's like, okay, I hear God. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Shay. Shay? Um, first, um, I think coming here today was just really like we're supposed to come today. I say. And we need tomorrow for Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And now you're giving us more places to go and see that make sure that we get there. Mm -hmm. And also like today, the, um, the crawl, the walk, the run, and then the fly, because you know, we have to build things in order. Mm -hmm. And when you're running, you know, you just, some people just keep running, and then they, they get tired, and they stop, and then they run some more, and they get tired, and they stop, and they get repetition, and they don't really go anywhere until they know how to fly. Right. When you sit there and say, okay, I'm, I'm tired of running, let me use what I've got now so I can fly, and you, you, when you fly, you just soar. There you go. And you don't get tired anymore. There you go. You, you just go. So I want to make sure like everything I do, that I stop running. And just, and just fly. Ashe. T1, did I get you? No, not yet. Then we'll save you for the last. So, um, what inspired me today was, um, as she mentioned, how Marcus Garvey, he self-educated himself. Mm -hmm. And how he used, you know, the creator, how his gifts, his talents, his abilities, and how he just accomplished all these goals mm -hmm. and brought us as people together mm -hmm. and like I said, even in, like right now, how we're, you know, we're learning about him and how we're, you know, doing some of the things that he does. So I like that. Ashe, Ashe. Okay, I'm going to need you to go sit in the middle. Take the chair. Sit, sit, put it right there in the middle. That's good. And have a seat. Don't cross your legs, put your hands in your lap, close your eyes, take a breath. Now, you can't talk until afterwards, and then we're going to let you share. I want you to just breathe, and we're going to start at this part of the room, and we're just going to say two things that we like about Genesis, mm -hmm. two positive things. Y'all get ready to speak. Um, you're very beautiful, um, and you strike me as very intelligent. Genesis, you are a great reader and your skin is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brooke, come. 
Say it out. You like her hair? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Genesis, I love your energy and enthusiasm, and I see a curiosity to learn. I would say a determination to learn, too. So. I love the fact that you like reading and like history, and I look forward to when we can switch seats. Mm -hmm. well, don't open those eyes yet. Well, I can let you run the, be the facilitator class, and I can sit here because I see that day coming. Because one of the things that uh, the Creator always does is the Creator always sends seeds mm -hmm. that will grow and blossom, and I'm trusting that this environment that we've created here will be the seed that allow you to grow and blossom and be the, the wonderful person that you are. And I look forward to you soon, not real soon, but soon, being able to do this class for people your age. And so the idea is we'll have ours with us who are above a certain age together, and then you'll have yours with those who are a certain age. And I, and I think that'd be really wonderful. And I think that um, I see that as part of the vision for you and things coming to me. Now, what you can do is now you can open your eyes, and you have to start the sentence with, I feel... Okay, there we go. Now you can go back and see. All right, so that ends class for the day.